So welcome so much to um, this afternoon discussion on how green spaces affect your health, uh, the community's health. And we are a community right here at UT Health San Antonio, and so we deeply appreciate our community and many members of San Antonio uh, in joining us for this uh, remarkable event, uh, two leaders of our city and our county coming together with our new dean of our School of Public Health, Dr. Vasan Ramachandran, a world's expert in cardiovascular health, and how green spaces, parks, and um, the uh, openness of our city promote the individual health that comes together into our city's health. Thank you for coming. This event was made possible through the support and dedication of Bill Henrich, my close friend and our beloved president, who helped Vaslan organize this event and believed in this event. He believed in green spaces uh, that were important for our community here at UT Health's uh, uh, well-being. On behalf of UT Health San Antonio, I really want to extend a deep appreciation for our remarkable special guest here today. I um, really want to recognize uh, District 8 Councilman Manny Peleas from the City of San Antonio. Manny, stand up and wave. Uh, please go up and shake his hand afterwards. He's really a wonderful person and uh, loves his constituents, and so we really appreciate him. I'd also like to recognize uh, someone who's becoming a friend, um, Texas State Senator Jose Menendez. Uh, he represents District 26. He is your senator. He represents our district, so please, if you have any ideas or suggestions, meet him afterwards. Um, and then um, our featured speakers today are two remarkable men who I'm proud to call friends. Um, one is the city of San Antonio's mayor, Ron Nuremberg. Uh, Ron will be up here in just a minute. Uh, Ron has been a tireless advocate for green spaces and promoting the city of San Antonio ever since he was elected. And it comes from the heart. It's not an issue. It's something he believes in. And, and then joining him uh, in our discussion today will be the Honorable Judge Nelson Wolf. Nelson has um, been a leader in uh, Bear County and San Antonio for decades and recently was uh, the uh, county judge and has led a remarkable transformation of uh, uh, Bear County, uh, which is unparalleled, I think, in actually the entire nation. We've grown so fast and so far, but we've done it with grace, uh, with efficiency, with caring for each other. San Antonio and Bayer County still have that connectedness and togetherness uh, that uh, we're known for throughout the last 300 years. Today's gathering is not just a gathering of individuals. It's really a testament to the collective commitment we share to fostering healthier communities, to fostering you and your family's health. And the upcoming moderated conversation between the mayor, the judge, and the dean uh, will be a great opportunity to understand that crucial link between green spaces and the public health. There is a direct scientific connectedness between how much green space we have in a city and the health of the individuals in that city. This is not uh, pseudoscience. There's real evidence that this is crucially important to our city's health. The rich history of San Antonio has made these features possible and the reason for that sit right here in this room. The mayor and the judge have played a key role in expanding green spaces throughout the county and the city. At UTL San Antonio, we understand that the health of the community extends beyond the walls of this building, beyond our hospital, our partner, University Health, um, extends beyond our clinics, the mark. It extends well out into every neighborhood in the entire city and the county. And we know that the Public's health is just more important than anything else we can do. If you're not healthy, if your mom is not healthy, if your child is not healthy, you are not happy. So we're contributing to the community's well-being by promoting the community's health, by promoting green spaces. As stewards of the public health, it's incumbent upon us to recognize how invaluable these green spaces are. And so we each hope you leave here today as an advocate for green spaces, as you meet with your communities, as you vote on how to use an open space in your own neighborhood, please think about a green space. In this city and the county will help you. 
Thank you again for joining us. And I really look forward to the wonderful panel discussion we have here today. We're taping it. We'll be on the web if some of you want to uh, view it again, or you have friends that weren't able to make it today or use it in your classrooms. I'm now privileged to welcome Senator Menendez of District 26, our district. He's gonna share some welcoming remarks. Senator, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be here with you all. I wanna thank, um, thank the UT Health Science Center School, the president, the leadership, the staff, all of you who've made today possible particularly the dean, and um, bringing all of us together for this important conversation. I also want to thank uh, my two dear friends for their vision, uh, both uh, Nelson, who uh, has been just about every public office you can be, city council, mayor, state, I think, senator, and county judge. And so uh, Nelson and Tracy have lived a life of public service, and have given back so much to this community and continue to do so. Uh, and then obviously our mayor, uh, proud to call him our mayor, someone who uh, has done such an incredible job that the, 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 the administration and, and he's on the national list of people who made things happen and work. And so Ron's doing a great job and, and he and Eric are also leaders in this community through what they do and their efforts at home. But I think what I, they share in common besides their public service is their acknowledgement of a healthy lifestyle. And healthy lifestyle needs to be more than just uh, what people in the past used to think of, whether it, what you diet, dieting is important, but it's not dieting. It's, it's how we eat. It's what we choose to eat. It's the decisions we make every day. Um, and then where the nexus of that is with exercise. And Many times, I think sometimes we talk ourselves out of exercise because we, we, we make it this big deal where we have to go put our running shoes on and our track clothes on and go to the track or go to the gym or go somewhere to do something. And, you know, the, what's interesting is, and this, many of us in this room know that this was long before Netflix put on the whole Blue Zones shows and documentaries on. The reality is that if you do happen to watch those where the longevity uh, exceeds the averages in those zones around the world, it's that these are communities where people get exercise without actually thinking about it, where they move on their own, where they, uh, in their daily lives, they don't depend on a gym membership. They have walkable, they live in walkable communities. They, they garden, they eat healthy things. They have a positive outlook. And all of these things that, that work together comprehensively to create a healthier outcome. And, um, you know, I, I know that my story is not a, uh, a unique story, but, but as a kid of immigrant parents who came from countries where the foods that they chose to eat sometimes were maybe not the healthiest. And it was interesting when my dad came home at 55 with diabetes and all of a sudden, he is like, well, we have to, I've the doctor said, I have to eat more fruits and vegetables now. We can't eat this and that. And it helped a child like my sister and I helped us see the relationship between uh, the choices that we made at the table and then exercise. And, and ironically, this morning, I have a friend who was telling me he needed to see a doctor. He's getting some numbness in his feet. And I said, well, tell me a little bit more. He says, well, they tell me that I'm pre-diabetic. And he, I could hear the, the, the denial in his voice. You know, I, they tell me, this is, I'm not sure. And he's a youngish guy, and, and, but he's overweight. And I said, hey, well, what about walking? And we don't live far from here. And I see the people walking around the, the, the area, the concrete paths. And I said, let's just meet and we'll go for a walk. Because the worst thing you can do for someone who's not in shape is to try to get them into a gym, into an, a, a, a scene, a scenario where they feel intimidated or it's just too much. And so I, I want to thank you all. I hope that today's conversation highlights that getting healthier doesn't have to mean uh, getting up at five in the morning to go to a gym. It, it can mean just make a little better choices, uh, choose to drink certain things, put certain things that are high in sugar on the side, and, uh, and just try to 
park a little further away, do the little things, take the stairs. And, and I think in doing so, uh, we can make decisions that are, that are going to get us to a better place. And, uh, and I, I remember the day that the doctor told me I was 36, that I had high cholesterol and I needed to take the statins. And I said, keep the prescription. And a year later, I dropped 36 pounds and uh, I changed, inverted my cholesterol levels. Um, we can do things like this by making better choices. And so um, I know I'm pre preaching to the choir, but I think we need to um, be kind to those who need the help to find the pathway to a healthier life and not make them feel like they're, uh, uh, they're inadequate, they're lesser than, they're dumb, they don't know what they're doing. I think that we have to be cautious in how we sort of encourage people to take that walk with us to a healthier life. And so thank you, doctor. Thank you to UT Health. It makes uh, uh, this institution and the people who run it make it a privilege to represent you in Austin, Texas. It is uh, these days not easy to represent uh, anyone in Austin, Texas, if you use your brain. But um, uh, I, I do my best uh, and it makes me I, it's the, part of the reason why I commute home every day is because I like to come home to where I feel that there are people who are thinking in a comprehensive way about our community together and not how we isolate and, and divide ourselves, but how we bring ourselves together. And today's a perfect example. Thank you very much. And I, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you all for being over here. I want to start with a quote by the astronaut Mike Collins at Apollo 11 when he looked down on our planet and he said, oh my God, that little thing is too fragile out there. I don't have to preach to the choir over here to talk about parks and green spaces other than to tell you who we are and what parks and spaces means to us as a species. We are literally hunter-gatherers. That's what we are physiologically. What we are supposed to be doing is wear leaves around our belly, go around eating berries and hunting game. Instead, we sit here in an auditorium and we have boxed lunches. <laughs> this is National Public Health Week and I cannot think of a better topic and better guess so I'm not called you over here to bore you with a lecture on public health. So there has to be a story, a conversation, and a setup. And so there's a setup, and then we have two protagonists that I'll introduce. And here's the setup. San Antonio ranks 57 among the 100 largest cities for its public parks. This is 2023. Good news, it was 59 in 2022. We moved up to... And this is from what's called as the Trust for the Public Land. It's a nonprofit organization. Large Texas cities didn't generally do as well. Austin and Dallas did better, 41 and 43. You can be satisfied, Houston ranked 71. Interestingly enough, if you zoom in, and there are multiple criteria for acreage, we scored a 71 out of 100. That's an A. For equity and for investment, we were somewhere close to 50. For access, we were 25. So that's a little bit on the lower side. 51% of San Antonio residents live within 10 minutes of a walk in the park. That is an A. At this point, I want to recognize our two guests and a little bit about them, and you all know a lot about them, so I'm going to just summarize. They are both entered the political arena as underdogs. Judge Wolf ran for mayor in 1991, and he took on an incumbent mayor, the first woman mayor, Mayor Leela Cockrell. And he's the only second person in the last 100 years who's been both a mayor and a county judge. Think about that. And Mayor Nirenberg ran for the district in 2013 as an underfunded candidate. And he, in Obama-esque fashion, worked with all the students and worked with all the young people. 
And fast forward, he's a four-time running mayor and probably the longest running mayor since Mr. Henry Cisneros. I want to welcome Judge Wolf and Mayor Ron Nirenberg. And there are four parts to this. This is a conversation. And so this is not a boring talk. So a little bit about the person. I'm trying to get into their heads, get into their shoes without getting under their skin. So, so I'll start with Judge Wolf and we'll go back and forth. Judge Wolf, you've had several titles, but I want to ask you a little bit about Judge Wolf or Nelson Wolf, the human being. What does it mean? What are your core values? Because what you do comes from those core values. If you have to talk about how Nelson Wolf, the human being, would like to be remembered, maybe we can start off there. I think there's two determining uh, parts in my life. Uh, when I dropped out of uh, University of Texas when I was a sophomore because my family was in trouble, and uh, we came back and uh, uh, started hauling lumber and and uh, started uh, uh, selling roofing off street corners at Southwest Military and then eventually building up to a small store. So I think uh, that defined my character because I understood how people had to work with their hands and do the things that a lot of people don't have to do. And then I think eventually when I got in law school, I, uh, I formed my political thinking and how a person should try to uh, uh, make society better. And then in, uh, when uh, President Kennedy was killed in 1983, uh, he was the hope of our generation and one that inspired us uh, to have a racially integrated society and to uh, uh, try to help each other and try to make government a, 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 a instrument that uh, people could be proud of and that could have a meaningful impact on everybody. So those two things really kind of determined my character and where I came from and where I still am today. Okay, thank you for that. A follow-up question for Judge Wolf. From state lawmaker to mayor to county judge, was that a planned linear transition or how did this happen? Well, law school starts it. <laughs> It's, no, it's not a coincidence that a lot of uh, politicians come out of law school because you learn how to stand on your feet, you learn how to speak, you know, learn how to think, you learn how to bring a problem down to the uh, guts of it, and then you develop a philosophy. And uh, uh, that, that didn't know where that was going to lead me. <laughs> I had no idea at the time, but it did lead me... Uh, when I was 29 years old, to the state representative seat, and then I became the youngest senator in the state of Texas, and then suffered a number of political defeats along the way. So it, it just evolves, I guess you would say. Okay, okay. What's your favorite book, Judge Nelson Wolf, other than the one you have written? Uh, my favorite book uh, is Gabriel uh, Garcia Marquez's uh, Love in the Time of Cholera. I think he's one of the greatest authors I've ever read. And I've uh, read most all of his books. Thank you. What's your favorite movie? A movie, uh, I'm a baseball nut, so I'd say Bull Durham was my favorite movie. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, I played baseball, hardball baseball, until I was 69 years old, so it's been a big part of my life. Thank you. Mayor Nirenberg, when you get up every day in the morning and have your coffee or your I read about your protein shakes. What, what, what thoughts are crossing your mind when you look at a day in City Hall, a long day in City Hall? What thoughts are on my mind as I have coffee in the morning? Um, you know, there's a lot in, in life in this period of time, and, and personally and professionally, is very interesting. Um, the first thought is usually uh, about my son, who is now a sophomore in high school. And, you know, making sure that he's got his stuff together and has done his homework and all those things. Um, but very quickly, my mind goes to where we are in the state of the world. Um, I listen to, so I ask Alexa to play the news briefings. And, you know, every, every 
headline uh, that comes out these days has such gravity uh, for my son's life in the future, uh, whether that's global affairs and the conflicts that are happening all across the world, or it's here at home and the protection of our own democracy. Um, I think a lot about those things and the kind of world we're leaving behind to our children and grandchildren, which is very much the reason why I got involved in politics in the first place. And so it's hard not to dwell on those things um, right now, but being in positions of, of authority and representative office affords us the ability to think through how we might respond and, and what we can do to improve those situations. Yeah, thank you for that. I read somewhere that your dad gave you a leather briefcase and you keep a copy of Aesop's Fables. And yeah, actually, so um, the briefcase has long since gone, but my dad actually did give me a briefcase when I was 10 years old. It was an old plastic hard shell. And at the time, my dream job was to be the beat writer for the Boston Red Sox. We have that in common. <laughs> and so when I was young and I couldn't quite play baseball as well, as well as I could write about it, I would create these little magazines, baseball magazines, and I'd go door to door with this briefcase and try to sell it to my neighbors. <laughs> um, but the Aesop's Fables is one that I still carry around. Um, I don't actually know if it's in my current briefcase, but I do carry it around. Um, I got fond of reading uh, during my first campaign, the fable, uh, The Lioness and the Vixen, which is really about the story of, um, you know, a, a supremely, powerful animal being um, that stays quiet until it's absolutely necessary to exhibit her prowess, uh, as opposed to the vixen who is out there bragging and, and you know, being, uh, you know, visible and, and, you know, braggadocious. That encapsulated my experience as a first-time candidate, uh, and I was reminded of people that, you know, don't, don't always pay attention to the loud one, Watch who, has, uh, watch who has the authority and the power who speaks up only when it's necessary. Yeah, thank you for that. I was reading about the rich cultural heritage with your familial roots spanning the globe. Yeah. And born in Boston, grew up in Austin, came to San Antonio, went to Philadelphia, back in San Antonio. Is San Antonio home for you? It feels like home for you? Absolutely, 100%. I didn't expect to come to San Antonio at all. I was growing up and went to high school in Austin, Texas, and my father convinced me to come down to San Antonio uh, to attend Trinity University, which wasn't really on my radar because I was thinking about going back to Boston where my roots are uh, for college. And he was correct in, in saying I'd get a, a, as good or a better education at Trinity for much less money than going to the East Coast. Uh, at the, and during that period of time, I fell in love with this city. It very much spoke to my multicultural background, um, a very formative experience, what shaped my core values, similar to what uh, Judge Wolf was saying, is multiculturalism and the fact that you know my parents and grandparents and ancestors from all over this world, it made me feel quite at home in a city like San Antonio, where there's such a, an incredible cultural diaspora. Um, I, I feel and still do that I can go into any room of any cultural constituency and feel like I'm at home with family. And so that was a, a quality of the city that I fell in love with and, and have firmly planted roots in the city. I've been here now for almost 30 years. Yeah, I read that you played the trombone and you were a DJ and you also were the sports writer for the Trinitonian. And editor-in-chief. And editor-in-chief. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite book, Mayor? My favorite book um, is Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. Uh, and if anyone's read that book, I fell in love with beat writers when I was in college. Um, the beatnik writers of the 50s and 60s, uh, books like uh, from Aldous Huxley, etc. But Siddhartha was one that really spoke to me. Uh, it's, it's about a journey of, towards enlightenment and, and uh, a young man turning it into an old man, taking his own way through life, and ultimately coming back to the universal values. Um, but, but that's one that still continues to speak to me. Favorite movie? I'm embarrassed to tell you what my favorite movie is. <laughs> but since he said Bull Durham, maybe you'll let me off the hook. 
My favorite movie is The Terminator. The first one. <laughs> it's the perfect, perfect story. Uh, incredible <laughs> cinematography that still hand, stands up. Uh, and, you know, of course, you have er early Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's, it's the best movie. <laughs> Thank you. Judge Wolf, when you were a child, were you inspired by parks and green spaces as a child? Well, when I grew up, we always stayed outside. Uh, there wasn't air conditioning. <laughs> so right across from where we lived, I was born on the south side of town at home. And when we were living on Astra Street, right across from us was Kite Field. And uh, every day I uh, was out there playing baseball. And then we lived close enough to the San Antonio River south that I spent a great deal of time along the San Antonio River. That was before the Corps of Army Engineers uh, bested up in the 60s by putting concrete and ruining the river. But uh, so I had the river and I had Kite Bill and I was outside all the time. Yeah, thank you. Do you spend a lot of time outdoors nowadays? If I, if I go out on the weekend, where could I find you? Well, I live uh, at Northwest Military and, uh, and uh, Wurzbach, and right across from there is Harburger Park. And so I do go to that park quite a bit. But I was down, and we may talk about that later. The big project we did at county was restoring the San Antonio River to what it looked like in my youth, and in fact, much better. I was down on the river just uh, last week, south of town. It was raining. I had a class there, UTSA students. It was a beautiful time to be on the river, even with the rain coming down on our umbrella. So if you have not gone on the uh, mission reach of the river, uh, uh, starting by, <coughs> right, you can, in fact, you can enter from the courthouse and go down. It is the most beautiful, restored, largest restoration of an urban river anywhere in the United States. Thank you. Mayor Nirenberg, you have a no sitting Saturdays rule. Uh, no sitting Saturdays rule. You are out on every Saturday yeah. somewhere. And what are the chances that I'll find you in the river walk or by the river down south? There's a pretty good chance, um, you know, if, I, if I'm out in a park, uh, nine times out of ten it's on the creekways. And the river walk and the creekways now are, are synonymous there on the south side. They, they are adjacent to each other and it's incredible, uh, an incredible feature in our community, a part of our economic competitiveness, frankly. But uh, those, are the, those are the green spaces I enjoy the most in San Antonio right now. Yeah, thank you. Now we'll move from the warm up to talking about a little bit about the past that Judge Wolf and Mayor Nirenberg have done. Judge Wolf, you, in 1992, while you were the mayor, you built the Government Canyon Park, 5,500 acres, and I believe it's the largest nature preserve located next to an American city. Well, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't know about Government Canyon. Uh, we always talk about parks, but this is the largest park next to an urban area anywhere in the United States of America. And it started during the time when I was mayor and we partnered with the county and then the state became a partner. And I remember going out there that first time. It was about 4,000 acres, I think, at that time. They had been foreclosed on. It was an opportunity for the government to step up and buy uh, something that we could preserve forever. You could see the dinosaur tracks. You can still see them today out there. Uh, it's an incredible um, uh, reserve and park. It went from that 4,000, I believe it's up to almost 14,000 acres now. Just think of that, a 14,000 acre park it's not a recreational park. It's a, a preserve, but one that where you can go along the trails and you can see what's there. Uh, it'll be preserved now forever. So that was a major, major uh, uh, effort that began during the time I was mayor. And now it's a state, it's run by the state of Texas, but uh, it's an incredible thing. If you haven't been out there, you need to go. How did that idea occur to you? How did you think of doing this? It stumbled on me. 
have stumbled because they were foreclosing. And the first uh, information I got out of it was from our water board uh, that there was an opportunity there. And then the uh, uh, state, and I think uh, Cindy Cryer was county judge at the time. And then the uh, state through their parks and wildlife department, we all three of us entities went out there that first time. So it was really kind of stumbled on because of the opportunity to buy it uh, through the foreclosure. You also worked on the Mitchell Lake. The Mitchell Lake is one of the few natural lakes in the state. Yeah. And what inspired you to, it was used as a sewage. About, about Mitchell Lake? Yeah. yeah. Well, when I grew up, it stunk like hell. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was where the refuge went. Southside got all the bad stuff, you understand? Floods and sewer and everything, all the bad stuff went down there south to us. And, and uh, so it was a, on, a, on certain days, man, it, you could really smell it. Uh, but <laughs> finally we built Reeling Road, uh, uh, plant when uh, Cisneros was uh, uh, mayor and that closed down, but it turned into, and we began the first stages of it, into a bird preserve. It's now one of the greatest uh, bird preserves anywhere in the United States. And if you go out there today, you don't have the smell. Uh, it, the, the land around it has been uh, preserved. Additional waters have been added to it. Uh, so it's a, it's a tremendous uh, restoration, urban Auburn Society is out there also. So it's, a, it's turned into really be something, but it was just the start when I was there. It's been improved a lot since I was there. Yeah, and, and for the audience, it, it's, uh, you know, before it was Mitchell Lake, it was called the Laguna de los Patos, the Lake of the Ducks, certainly <laughs> worth going down there. I want to turn to Mayor Nirenberg. When you were a councilman, you strung together funding for what became the Bracken Bat Cave. Yeah. What drew you to preserving an area for one of the largest colonies of bats in the country? Well, when I was campaigning uh, for city council, obviously one of the things that you do uh, is listen to the concerns of people in your community. Uh, and I knew that water was a significant issue for the future of the city, so I was already interested in water issues and the aquifer. Uh, but there was this big hot button issue that had just gotten on everybody's radar, which is the fact that there was a massive uh, suburban development in the middle of nowhere, uh, outside of our jurisdiction, really outside of every juri everybody's jurisdiction, that was going to be adjacent to what I learned was the largest um, and most dense colony of mammals on Earth, which is the Brad Bracken Bat Cave. It also had significant importance for our water supply, because it was a major recharge feature, as well as the fact that bats have a critical link in our whole ecosystem, and they're important for the agricultural community, et cetera. So a lot of reasons why we should care, yet nobody seemed to be willing to take it on because it was outside of everybody's jurisdiction. So as soon as I got elected, I went to go see Mayor Castro, and I said, let, him, let me work on this. I'd, I'd like to figure out if there's a solution here. Um, and I got uh, his okay to start you know, talking about the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program, which could potentially be utilized as a source of funding. Long story short, I became very passionate about this issue, even more passionate about water issues, and seeing the linkages that this particular issue had with so many important existential issues for our community's long-term health. Um, we eventually put together a public-private co uh, coalition uh, that was able to acquire the property and protect this bat preserve uh, and the, all the other aspects of it uh, in perpetuity. So I'm very proud of that, um, that win environmentally. Yeah, thank you for that. I also heard that in 2017, a few days into your taking over office, you approved the Paris Climate Accord, whereas the yeah. country was withdrawing from it. Yeah, um, and my first day in office, we uh, actually, after I got sworn in on the same council agenda, I had agendized approval of a resolution to get back in to, the, to our commitments on the Paris Climate Accord at the local level, which is obviously a, an important issue, which set the course for us to, sit, to develop the Climate Action Adaptation Plan. When you think about this, 
When I was elected in 2017, I had, I had defeated an incumbent. There were several new council members. We were a brand new city council, so it was a lot to ask my colleagues, including Councilman Pelias, who was sworn in on the same day. It was a lot to ask for us to make this major decision on the very first day, literally minutes after we were sworn in, but it was important for me uh, for us to, to set this new administration off on the right foot and to tell people where we're going. We approved that uh, a couple years later. We ratified a climate action adaptation plan. It became groundbreaking nationally because it's the first climate action adaptation plan at the local level that was rooted first in this concept of, of um, environmental justice, accounting for equity in the issues of inequity when it comes to implementing climate solutions. So. Uh, yeah, we're, we're embarking on that, and it's a citywide, community-wide effort to mitigate the impacts of climate change, but also take action in what we know we can do to limit the greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Judge Wolf, there's one project you did which stood out for me in its magnitude, and that's the 13 additional miles of the park, of the river walk from the Pearl down to Mission Espada, where you planted, you arranged for restoration of the entire ecosystem, 20,000 trees, 10,000 pounds of grass. It's a massive project. Yeah, vibration. Yeah, the, the mission reach of the- of Oh, the, the mission reach, yeah. Uh, obviously, from my childhood, it was important to me to be able to address that issue. So we went to the voters in 2008 and asked them uh, to fund uh, 140, I think it was 145 million uh, for, the, for the river going south to restore it. Uh, so without that funding, it would have never been done. Uh, so we were contracted with the San Antonio River Authority to do it. We oversaw the project. We added another $75 million to it. And now, along that eight-mile stretch, uh, you will see uh, some 20,000 trees that we planted, 60 different species of uh, plants and, and grasses. Uh, and, and if you go down there today, you'll see how much a tree can grow in, in 10 years. We finished it in 2013. Uh, we created uh, repairing white walkways, uh, we created trails, we created portals to the missions. Uh, so if you haven't been there, you'll see one of the greatest uh, environmental restorations anywhere. And you could go any time of the year. Uh, like I say, I was down there and it was raining the other day and I still enjoyed it very much. And Confluence Park is right there where the San Pedro Creek comes into the river. And that park will show you all the ecological uh, efforts that are made here in the San Antonio region. Uh, it's just uh, such a relaxing, uh, wonderful place to be. And it's exciting to me because it brought back what we had lost because of mistakes made by the uh, Corps of Arm Engineers. So that's my favorite, favorite place to go. And I still make the trek over to the south side of town to go and do it as much as I can. Rasan, can I add something to that? So yeah. this is really, th this project, is really important. San Antonio is known as a city of history and heritage. And when we think about history and heritage, we think about the major architectural feats, you know, the landmarks like the Alamo, et cetera. But the Mission Reach project proved that the environment, our natural heritage, is also part of our history. And this was an ecological restoration. It brought the river back to its heyday and, and its environmental history. The same thing, similar to what the judge mentioned at Phil Hardberger Park. If you go out to Phil Hardberger Park, that was a pasture. Right. And if you had gone out there when Phil hugged the tree, yeah. it didn't look like <laughs> yeah. anything it is now. <laughs> but where, when you go out to Phil Hardberger Park now and you look across the pasture, you will see Texas as it was 200, 300 years ago. All of that native uh, bio, botany, et cetera, all those... Plants are all part of the native Texas history, which had been completely uh, shrubbed over by invasive species. All that now has been restored. And I think it's as, part of, as much a part of our historical heritage and identity as any building on our landscape can be. 
Angus, very well said. Very well said. It's important for what we call as land sovereignty, or food sovereignty, both for humans as well as for the animals. And that's a fabulous project there. Judge Wolf, you also supported the San Antonio Arboretum, the Arboretum project of Mr. Cisneros. Yeah. And on the south side, what inspired you to do that? Well, Henry Cisneros came up with the idea of Arboretum. So uh, he would send me all this material and I would go to Houston and I would look at different Arboretums around, the, uh, around, around Texas. And the idea of it is, is that we celebrate the heritage of our trees. Trees evolved about 400 million years ago. We wouldn't be here without the leaves of the tree that has the photosynthesis that brings us uh, some oxygen. So there are wonderful species that change the whole makeup of our earth and allowed us to be here. Uh, so the idea of an arboretum is to celebrate the trees, to show people the different species of trees that we have, uh, to have a research center there, uh, to have a, a public information center there, and certainly to have the education component for young people. Now, we looked at several different uh, sites, and, uh, but we were lucky because uh, the old Republic golf course on the south side of town became available. It was about 180 some odd acres, I believe. And uh, so we set aside before I left, I think it was $7.2 million uh, to help bring about the Arboretum. Uh, Henry uh, has a foundation that they started. His brother-in-law is running it. And uh, in fact, my wife is meeting with him next week to see what additional funds they need to raise to, 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 to make it come about. But it'll be something unique for San Antonio, something we don't have. And I think it's the most major forward-looking uh, uh, project that we have to preserve our land and, and, and the heritage of it. Just one quick thing I wanted to mention also on the river going south, the Mission Reach. When you take in the city parks, county parks, the uh, four missions and the land that we have is preserved around there, that's 2,400 acres. That's six times, of, I mean, three times the size of Central Park. So it's a huge park in itself if you want to think of a park. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mayor Nirenberg, if, if a Martian came down to the earth and, and they had just 30 minutes to see some park, or trailways in San Antonio or Bear County, where would you send that Martian? <laughs> well, who says they're not? <laughs> um, but if I ever met one, um, I, would, I would highly encourage them to uh, take a stroll around the creekways. Um, number one, you won't find another creekway system in the country that's as well developed as ours. It goes it to as amazing. many different urban places as it does. It's also about the persistence and longevity of a vision uh, that was first articulated by Mayor Howard Peake. Um, and it's, it's a publicly supported mission, so it's a commentary on the fact that our community really supports uh, green spaces. And then the, my favorite part is that it changes every day. I mean, we're literally adding miles to it every single year. The county is invested in it, the city's invested in it. We have created a new funding mechanism, so even though we have other issues we've got to deal with, we are continuing to fund that. So I would definitely walk around the Creekway Trails, and you'll find some celebrities on there, too. As you know, you know one of Manu Ginobili's favorite places to be in this city is, is the Greenway Trail, so it's a great place to be. Let, let me add one quick thing to that. Uh, uh, Mary Nuremberg really uh, added a big, big piece to that. I think now the city has 86 miles or so. We're over 100 now. Is it over yeah. 100 now? And I, I know he came to me during the same period that you were putting up more money and said, well, the county needs to start helping on the creekways. And we did. I think we, added about, we had enough money to add about 32 miles. And there's a, the big projects so are the West Side Creeks going today, yep. uh, which I think is going to help really revitalize the West Side of San Antonio. So. I think that's probably one of the, well, it is one of the most important 
environmental projects that the city took on was to do the creekways. Yeah, and think about it. It's also what Mayor, uh, with uh, what Senator Menendez was talking about when we have to, we think about uh, physical activity so you don't really have to plan it, you're, you're just doing it. The Greenway trails are also transportation. Yeah. We can connect it to more places. People can use it to get from one point to another. And I, I would just like to also plug what I am hoping will be a annual event which is that this past October, we launched Camino Verde, which is, an, again, hopefully an annual event sponsored by the Mayor's Fitness Council, which basically will go from different places around the Creekway Trails, have health fairs and, and different things that people can learn about wellness, but also have San Antonio residents get to know different parts of this massive trail system. Yeah, yeah thank you for that. Talking about the future, you know, San Antonio, when it's graded for its parks, it did well in acreage. It's got a 71 out of 100. It did not as well for the access. We got a 25 out of 100. Right. Mayor, could you comment on steps yeah. to increase that? So this speaks to the larger issues in politics. Two things can be true at the same time. One is that you cannot be where you want to be, but also that you are moving in that direction. Uh, over the last 20 years, uh, 25 years, including Mayor Wolf's time in office, San Antonio has been making progressive improvements in the park system, adding green space, making sure that people had access, better access to green spaces. If you look at that park score, nobody here should be satisfied with a 57 out of 100. But if you go back and look where that number has moved, it has steadily improved over the last 15 years. Also, if you look below just that park score, and look at the numbers, there is actually, there are maybe one or two cities in the country that are making such leapfrogged improvements in terms of access uh, and the total acreage of, of green, green space in their communities as San Antonio is. So San Antonio is making phenomenal improvements. It would be a great mistake for us to look at the park score and say, we've got to do something different because we are actually moving in the right direction with respect to green space in this community. Thank you for that. If, if you were gifted a Ron Nirenberg Park, where would you look at it? <laughs> um, name aside, uh, <laughs> I, I really am interested in the further preservation of green space in the Hill Country that's actually not even in our jurisdiction. And I do hope that people go look at Government Canyon. It is an, an, an incredible feature. Uh, it is also a walk back in time. You can see dinosaur tracks in there. Uh, Bracken Bat Cave is, is also in that region that we desperately need to protect. Um, Henry B. Gonzalez, way back, recognized the importance of that emerald ring north of us and the protection of it for the betterment of our water quality in this region. All. All of our water supply at that time was from the Edwards Aquifer. A majority of it still is and will be forevermore. And so we've got to protect the water quality that comes into San Antonio and, and protection of the green space in that region is critically important. There are major features in it like the Bracken Bat Cave that give us more bang for our buck in terms of preservation. What I would want to see is continued preservation of that area around. And you, you'll look at the headlines in the paper today there are constant developments right. and you know mining that's happening in that area and we've got to really think through what do we want this region to look like in the next you know 50 years if that continues unabated without some speaking for the environment okay last two questions <laughs> and this is unsolicited advice judge wolf if you had to advise mayor ron Nirenberg about green spaces in a second term, what advice would you offer to? Uh, uh, well, did you ask me that Martian question? <laughs> 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 I was ready for that. Uh, you, he asked you that, didn't he? Well, give, give the Martian the advice. Then. <laughs> well, I am a Martian, so I understand how they think. <laughs> Uh, my wife convinced me I was uh, because I'd hardly ever go to the doctor and I can still run as fast as a bolt of lightning. So she thinks I'm a Martian and I like that idea, but let me tell you how they're thinking. They're looking down here at our world 
And they really think we're doing a terrible job of trying to preserve this earth for future generations. They're well aware of the Stockholm Resilience Report that came out here just recently that set nine boundaries about how we take care of our, of our natural environment. Six of those we have crossed. Fresh water availability, deforestation, biodiversity loss, extensions, concentrations of carbon dioxide, and spread of disease. Now, they're concerned about that. And why would a Martian be concerned about that? Because they know Elon Musk and his cohorts are fixing to invade them. <laughs> so they are concerned that we start taking care of our Earth. They don't want us up there. And they love the kind of projects we're doing. Uh, but we are local government. Ron and I represent local government. And so we're doing everything within our power uh, to preserve our environment, to protect the aquifer. There's 25 million to 50 million acre feet of water right below our feet. It's uh, something like 80 miles long and wide. And, uh, and we passed the first uh, aquifer protection when I was mayor, but then a lot more has been added on that. And what Ron was saying a few minutes ago is important to protect that. We don't see it, but it's there, and it's extremely important to our community. So the Martians believe we need to do everything we can to preserve our Earth so we would leave them alone. And uh, so I, when we show them what we're doing here, they're very, very happy with you and I. Uh, but they're not so happy <laughs> with the federal government or the state government or the world that's going on today. So all of us have to work to preserve the environment. Yes, it's good for health, but it's also good for the health of our Earth. And, uh, and so that's what they're thinking, and I think they're pretty damn smart. <laughs> Mayor Nittenberg, <laughs> what, what advice would you give Judge Wolf in his retirement years, if any? Well, um... It's too late now, but I was going to say, don't quit your day job. Um, I would, so I would encourage uh, former Judge Nelson Wolf to continue to be an advocate uh, and to continue to use his voice, which there are few equals in terms of the credibility amassed over a lifetime of public service. Um, you know, the, we're going into election season in November, and then we're gonna to go to another election season in May. And so we have a lot of opportunities now to elect representatives who are going to uh, represent our country and this community. Um, and, and there are people who have done the work and who now have stepped uh, aside to allow other people to do the work, who have perspective on what it takes to actually get the work done. And I think that perspective is vitally important for, for the judge to offer to this community as it makes those decisions. Um, and I would say that uh, in particular, this issue of the environment is one of them. Um, you know, oftentimes, and I, I, you know, I hope that um, you know, the representatives that you've seen here today are not like this, and it's, it's uh, easier at the local level to say it like it is and to do the right thing. But oftentimes people are, are um, hesitant to be candid with the public. Nelson certainly has never been hesitant to be candid, uh, and his voice is going to be incredibly important to level set with the community about what we should be voting on, the issues, uh, and what we should be paying attention to as we go to the ballot box over the next several years. Thank you. I think that brings us to the end of this conversation. I want the audience to give our two panelists, our two protagonists, a big round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Nelson. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs>